Hello, my name is Bogdana Nemtsu and this is module number 4, Social Sustainability. This course will address the role of local governments in the provision of infrastructure and public services. If you remember the previous session, we discussed about needs and assets at community level. The lack of infrastructure and services is usually regarded as a huge problem or unfulfilled need at local level. The lack of infrastructure is relatively difficult to solve, mostly because there are huge costs associated with building and maintaining infrastructure, and there are complicated intergovernmental relations. For example, local governments may not be exclusively responsible for this task. Very often, the central government will finance uh, such infrastructure projects in their entirety or in part, while the local governments will be responsible for maintaining them. I will mostly address the lack of infrastructure as a problem in some of the least developed countries and communities because it represents one of the most significant limitations to economic growth. Infrastructure investments and maintenance can be very expensive, as I already said, especially in such areas as landlocked, rural and sparsely populated countries in Africa. It is important to think about some numbers because, for example, infrastructure investment contributed to more than half of Africa's improved growth performance between 1990s and 2005. Other significant um, numbers refer to the returns to investment in infrastructure, which are significant, with an average 30 to 40 returns for telecommunication investments and over 40% for electricity generation and even more significantly 80% for roads. In the literature there is one connection that is explored namely the link between infrastructure and poverty reduction. Of course, as I already said, this is explored in the context of the least developed countries. What is the, the role infrastructure plays? I would mention three main ways in which infrastructure contributes to promoting growth. First, it's through the impact on growth potential to the provision of essential services such as energy, transportation, water. Through the impact of infrastructure construction on growth and employment. And perhaps extremely important and often ignored, through the impact on people's lives and opportunities. This is the most fundamental development impact because through enabling the time of men, women and children to be more productive, through reducing transaction costs, promoting communications and creating economic and social interactions. What exactly do we include under this umbrella concept of infrastructure? I would not dwell a lot on this issue, I would just provide you with a simple definition which states that infrastructure includes all the structures, the systems and facilities serving a country, city or area, including the services and facilities that are necessary for its economy to function. Of course that when you are thinking about infrastructure, you can give examples of roads, bridges, water supplies, telecommunications and so on. However, I would insist on a more um, 
precise classification of infrastructure. On the one hand, we have economic infrastructure and social infrastructure. Economic, you have roads, waste facilities, and social infrastructure includes schools, hospitals, parks. parks. Another distinction is between hard and soft infrastructure. Hard infrastructure refers to large physical networks, while soft infrastructure, which is more difficult to observe, refers to institutions which are required to maintain the economy, health and cultural and social standards of a country. Another distinction operates at the level of urban or municipal infrastructure, which refers to hard infrastructure systems which are generally owned and operated by municipalities, such as streets, water distribution and sewers. It may also include some of the facilities associated with soft infrastructure, such as parks, public, po public pools, schools. A concept that is often overlapping with infrastructure is public services. In many works, they are used as synonyms. What are some questions or concerns regarding infrastructure projects in the least developed countries? First of all, we need to understand that by simply having infrastructures, not all problems are solved, and that very often capa limited capacity may be an issue. So, one of the questions that we have to ask is if growth in these countries has reached a rate which is created which is creating real demand for infrastructure because otherwise you will have the infrastructure financed by international donors but people won't will not have money to use it we also need to be aware that there are huge capacity constraints in state capacity in planning and management of infrastructure at all levels. Effective infrastructure would require the development of a strong and effective state institutional structure. Another concern has to do with financial sustainability which is important to maintain macro stability and ensure that infrastructure investments were ef efficient and enhance productivity. Right now, in the literature, but also in practice in this context, in the context of these developing countries, the emphasis is placed on several issues. First of all, there is a real concern for enhancing the role of local or subnational governments in the provision of infrastructure. We are talking here about various forms of decentralization. We are going to address the issue of decentralization in the next slide. There is also the concern about how to ensure the empowering of local communities through various participatory agreements in selecting priorities and implementing activities. A third major concern uh, regarding efficiency has to do with ways in which to involve the private sector in the provision of infrastructure and public services. Why do we want local governments to be involved in the provision of infrastructure and other public services. Of course, we are thinking about advantages by comparison to central government. Local governments can sometimes be better informed than the central government about local needs. They can be more sensitive to disadvantaged groups and ethnic minorities. They can be more efficient with respect to resource allocation. They are under direct pressure from the local constituencies and therefore they are more prone to provide primary infrastructure than, than large investment. Basic facilities usually favor the poor people, which is extremely important in developing countries.
local governments are better positioned to provide infrastructure services even when there is little scope for economies of scale. However, we should be aware of the fact that decentralization or the transfer of service provision at the local level has also problems. Very often local governments have inadequate human financial and logistic resources. For example, you can have staff who is lacking technical and managerial skills and this lowers the quality of services. Decentralization can also lead to corruption and can favor the accumulation of power by local elites. It can also generate regional inequalities, thus working against the poorest of the communities. I have to warn you that there are high risks associated with allowing local governments to provide service, certain services. For example, vaccination. If not all local governments are able to provide it in a certain way, then some communities and individuals may be prone to suffering. This is why, under certain conditions, some services are better provided by the national government. At this point in my presentation, I am about to shift a little bit the focus. The previous slides have focused on infrastructure provision in the context of least developed countries. In the remaining part of this presentation, I would like to deal with EU countries with an emphasis on the case of Romania. Infrastructure and provision of public services will be examined in the context of decentralization, rescaling of the state and intermunicipal cooperation. Some issues pertaining to decentralization are the same in the developing and developed countries. However, there are other issues that have to be discussed separately. This is the reason why we are at this point shifting the focus and emphasizing the problems in the context of EU member states. Let me go back a little bit to the concept of decentralization. Throughout the world, decentralization is viewed as a component of good governments and development. However, I have to warn you that it is a complex process and therefore there are numerous failures associated with it. One author pointed out that we know more about what doesn't work with regard to decentralization rather than what works. The main argument for decentralization goes like this. If public agencies can fulfill their tasks closer to the citizens they have to serve, then the latter will obtain more benefits and will accept more easily the authority of those public institutions. When we are talking about decentralization, not all systems and not all countries are similar. There are three main types of processes which can run in parallel. We have deconcentration, delegation and devolution. It is important to distinguish because it is important to distinguish among these three concepts because they refer to different processes. In deconcentration, the central government disperses responsibilities for certain services to regional branch offices without transfer of authority. Delegation refers to a different situation in which the central government transfers responsibility for certain decision-making and administration of public function to local government. In this situation, Local governments are not fully controlled by central governments, as in the case of deconcentration. 
Devolution, perhaps the most advanced form of decentralization, happens when the central government transfers authority for decision-making, finance, and administrative and administrative management to quasi-autonomous units of local government. We can also distinguish between political decentralization, administrative decentralization, and fiscal decentralization. Again, these distinctions are not merely theoretical. They have important practical implications because um, political decentralization allows for a certain degree of um, representation at the local level and allows for an uh, elected body bodies at local level. Administrative um, decentralization mostly has to do with the policy competencies of local bodies, while fiscal decentralization regards the extent to which local entities collect taxes, undertake expenditures, and rectify imbalances. It is also important to understand that even if you have political and administrative decentralization in a certain setting, the lack of proper fiscal decentralization may make the first two components of decentralization irrelevant. Without money, local governments will be forced not to perform properly their tasks. I will suggest you to think about decentralization as a continuum under which, from left to right, responsibilities, access to resources, accountability range in degree from country to country. I can tell you that a lot of the member states of the European Union in fact, all of them are decentralized systems. However, the degree of decentralization is variable. Please take a look at the table on slide 16 and see how various components and of decentralization vary from a minimum to a maximum. What, are, what is the connection between decentralization of pro and provision of services? At European level, there have been several stages in the evolution of decentralization coupled with different approaches to infrastructure and service delivery. It's important to understand this because the option of local and central governments for certain types of service provision depends upon the stages. The first stage, the 1970s and 1980s, was marked by processes of deconcentration of hierarchical structures and bureaucracies, as the governments were trying to make their public services more efficient and to increase the territorial coverage by transferring responsibility toward the subnational level. We then go to the second stage, which is starting with the mid-1980s and includes the expansion of the concept in order to cover the sharing of political power, democratization, market liberalization. In the third stage, starting with the 1990s, decentralization overlaps with the occurrence of new public management, a trend which brings into question the role of the public sector. At this point, the central and local government needs to be innovative, oriented towards the market, decentralized, and focus on the delivery of high-quality public services. In the fourth stage, we have the phenomenon of globalization, which forces national governments to increase the administrative and fiscal capacity of regional and local levels. In infrastructure, high living standards as well as high quality of services are things that are necessary to make regions competitive. I want to tell you that 
One common trend among European countries with regard to decentralization reform is the fact that they are now focused on the rescaling of the state. What does this mean? It means simply finding the level at which public services are provided with greater economic efficiency. Administrative fragmentation, for example, communities that are too small to perform their function independently, represents a key challenge toward the provision of public services and municipal infrastructure. In Europe, there are two types of strategies employed to counter fragmentation. On the one hand, you can force rural communities to, to become merged, no longer have communities under 5,000 inhabitants or more. On the other hand, you can build intermunicipal cooperation. In Romania, this intermunicipal cooperation takes the form of associations for community development and metropolitan areas. It is important to understand that the central and the local governments have a complicated relationship, which has to be solved by using various structures and rules. Central governments can use either the stick, mandatory regulation to force communities to cooperate, or the carrot, which pretty much means financial incentive and preferred access to grants. It depends upon each country and each central government to decide which approach will work better in the case of a certain country. What are some of the trends uh, that we can nowadays witness in terms of infrastructure and service provision at community level? First of all, certain services need to be provided at metropolitan level, sometimes even at regional level. You have to think about cities which are constantly expansive. For example, population and businesses are suburbanizing, moving outside at the outskirts of cities. Transportation is one of the first services for which there is a request to be provided at metropolitan level. Citizens no longer care where one community ends and the other starts. All they care about is effective transportation. However, this is complicated because taxes are collected locally at, each, at the level of each city or rural community and various institutional arrangements to, need to be developed in order to ensure metropolitan provision of services. A second trend has to do with the huge gaps between rural and urban communities. In certain countries, such as Romania, certain services are no longer provided in rural communities. For example, very poor rural villages cannot afford to have public lighting. A third trend has to do with the establishment of regional operators for water and sewage and for waste collection and disposal. For example, um, communities in Romania are under stringent requirements from EU, especially in terms of environmental performance and compliance with environmental regulation. This has made regional operators better equipped to attract EU structural funds. Local governments, on the other hand, have less control over these services. 